Hi everyone, welcome to my talk. My name is Paola Renteria and I am a product analyst at Looker. Today I'll be talking to you about how we effectively model and develop code at Looker. I'd like to start today's talk by talking about the legacy deployment of Looker at Looker. I'd love to then jump into our hub and spoke project architecture that enables us to reuse code across various projects. Third, I'll be talking about our ambassador program, which enables other users to collaborate on our existing projects and models. And lastly, I'd love to review our developer workflow that we follow internally at Looker. Before we jump into the existing project setup, it's helpful to understand how we previously deployed and managed code at Looker. In the legacy Looker setup, we had a single Looker project and a single Looker model that served all departments at Looker. This included various teams, including sales, customer success, engineering and product, and marketing. There were hundreds of view files and many, many lines of code. This was also before folders were introduced into the Looker IDE. So you can imagine how difficult it might be for a developer to find a specific field or file that they're looking for. With the single Looker project setup, all employees had access to develop and deploy against all look ML code. So this means that hundreds of users could contribute to the same code. The lack of permissioning and governance led to a few issues. There was no clear ownership of look ML code or business logic. So if a developer wanted to understand why total revenue was calculated a certain way, it was difficult to find the appropriate owner because there were over 20 contributors to a single view file and many of them had touched the logic for a single field. This also led to duplication of fields and explores. Because not one team owned the code and knew what was being deployed to production, users would duplicate explores that already existed. Or they would duplicate fields with different variations of field names. Take for example, a user lands on an explore and they see two fields for account name. One named name and the other account name. And they didn't know which was the right one to use. As you can imagine, the duplication of fields and explorers led to difficulty trusting metrics. Users were hesitant to use fields or explorers because they didn't know if what they had was correct. To solve these problems, our team introduced the Hub and Spoke project architecture. The Hub and Spoke project architecture is an architecture that allows us to define core business metrics and logic in a centralized hub. We then utilize Looker's project import and extends functionality to bring that logic into other projects. Within the diagram on the screen, you can see that all of the sections in the diagram represent a Looker project. The hub is a project where the core business logic is defined in view files and maintained by the data team. There are no models in the hub and no queryable explores. However, there are explore templates that can be extended and reused across other projects. The point of the hub is to define business logic in one place and provide accurate and consistent information that all departments can reuse. The official spoke is a project that has all of the core business explorers. These explorers can be accessed by all Looker employees and they contain metrics that are used company-wide. At Looker internally, this is where our core sales explorers live. These explorers contain fields that are reused across various departments such as total revenue or the classification of a current customer. As you can imagine, these are fields that are used across various departments, including customer success, engineering and product and marketing. All of the metrics in these explorers are used company-wide to keep a pulse of the business. The other spokes or projects in the architecture are either department-specific or use-case-specific spokes. The department-specific spoke is exactly what it sounds like. It's a project dedicated to a single department or organization. An example of this is the customer success spoke. This might have information on support tickets that only the customer success team can access. The use-case-specific spokes can also be configured so that only a subset of users can access. These spokes are useful for cases where a single use case is used across various departments, but it doesn't necessarily include metrics that are used company-wide. For example, a ticketing system that is used across multiple departments at a company should be surfaced to all teams that use that ticketing system. Instead of having duplicate explorers for each department in the department spokes, we can have a single use case spoke that can be accessed across various teams. In order to import logic, view files, and explorers from the hub project, we utilize Looker's project import feature. There are two ways to import files from another project. The first is by using remote import. This is the example you see on the screen on the left-hand side. This allows the developer to specify a Git repository URL and point it to the master branch. When changes are made to the underlying project that we are importing, it is the developer's responsibility to update the dependencies to make sure that the project is up to date with the latest project changes in the hub. The second way to import files is to use local import. 
For local import, both projects must be on the same Looker instance, and the developers must have develop permissions in both projects. With local import, the projects automatically sync in both development mode and production, so the user is not responsible for updating the dependencies. This can be very convenient when developing, but it might not be the best option if the users don't already have developer permissions in the hub. Using Looker's project import functionality and the hub and spoke architecture, our team was able to solve the problems we previously ran into. Having multiple models and projects allowed us to configure permissions appropriately so that teams only saw information that was relevant to them. Each project now has clear ownership. The hub is owned and managed by the centralized data team and the spokes are managed by ambassadors. Having appropriate owners and ambassadors ensures that fuels and explorers are not redundant or duplicated, which promotes for a much better end user experience. Let's talk some more about ambassadors and how that fits into our hub and spoke project architecture. If we take a look at our hub and spoke project architecture again, we can see how the data team and ambassadors own different projects. The centralized data team owns the hub and the official spoke since this contains a core business metric and logic that is used company-wide. Whereas the department and use case specific spokes are owned by ambassadors or users who are most familiar with that project. So what does it mean to be an ambassador? An ambassador is an individual who can serve as a liaison between the centralized data team, other developers, and their end users. They're familiar with LookML and they understand the overall hub and spoke project architecture. There are also the subject matter experts or SMEs of their team or department's core metrics and logic. It's important to note the ambassadors don't have to be data analysts. Internally, we have ambassadors that are product managers or sales managers. What's most important is that they understand LookML, the hub and spoke project architecture, and they can serve as a liaison with other developers. The ambassadors must also complete our training on SQL, LookML, and pull request guidelines to ensure consistency across projects. Let's review our developer workflow. Once a user is an ambassador, they can begin making changes to the LookML code. They want to ensure that the changes they make follow the LookML, SQL, and pull request guidelines that we follow internally. Our LookML guidelines can be broken down into three sections, fields, views, and explores. For dimensions and measures, we want to ensure that we always define a primary key. This is crucial for Looker symmetric aggregates to be executed accurately. All dimensions and measures should have a description defined, even if the field is hidden. A description is not only helpful for the end user experience within an explorer, but it also helps other developers understand what a field represents when they're only looking at the LookML code. In addition to descriptions, using group labels also promotes a better end user experience because related fields can be found together. Our team also requires defining drill fields on all measures to encourage end users to ask more questions. Within the LookML code for view files, we require a view header that defines the owner, the date it was created, and the purpose of the file. This really helps other developers understand why a view file is added or why it's being used. We also ask that developers separate dimensions, measures, and field sets from one another, which makes it much easier to find fields within the file. And lastly, for explorers, we ask that the user adds clear and meaningful descriptions to all explorers, even if they're hidden. View labels and field sets help organize and explore. View labels can be used to show related fields together on the front end, similar to group labels, and field sets help reduce or limit the fields available within an explorer. Lastly, if an explorer is not widely used or it is being created for a one-off analysis, it's best to keep it hidden. Users can still easily access the explorer from the URL directly or from dashboards or looks, and it helps reduce the clutter from the explorer dropdown. Reusability is also key. We encourage utilizing Looker's extends functionality to import from the hub project, especially fields have already been defined elsewhere. Along with extends, referencing other fields using Looker substitution operators rather than referencing the underlying column directly makes for a much better developer experience. This makes it so that the logic only needs to be updated once and the updated logic cascades to the field reference directly. Native derived tables can also be very useful if the developer is looking to reuse joins or logic that has already been defined in the LookML once. So once the developer ensures that their code meets the developer guidelines, they can open a pull request using their Git provider. Once the pull request is created, the user can post a link with the pull request, the purpose, the complexity, and the time estimate for review so that other developers can review. We have a chat channel internally that includes all ambassadors, and the centralized data team so that other users can help review each other's code. 
Pull requests give other users the opportunity to review each other's code and learn from one another. Remember that not all LookML code is perfect, and we've always found that another set of eyes helps catch minimal errors or potential mistakes. Having someone else review also ensures a common style, and it allows developers to spread knowledge of best practices in SQL or LookML. This also brings general awareness of what other developers might be working on. It's always great to see what other developers are working on to see if there's an overlap in the work that you're doing with the work that they might be doing. Once another developer approves a pull request, the code is then merged to the master branch. To summarize, the Hub and Spoke project architecture allows our team to reuse code efficiently. We're able to empower other users to collaborate on our models, view files, and projects through our ambassador program. We're also able to specify the appropriate permissions for each project so that users only see information that is relevant to them. I hope you found that helpful. If you have any questions or would like to further discuss the Hub and Spoke project architecture, you can find me on LinkedIn as Paola Renderia. Thank you for joining me today.